Hello to everyone. Uh, welcome to a new uh, EasySEM eChat. I have the pleasure today to interview Professor Jean-Louis Vincent. And uh, of course, I, uh, I will like to discuss with him about the new surviving sepsis campaign guidelines. So the first question I have for you, are you happy with these new guidelines? Well, I am both happy and unhappy in a way. Uh, well, first of all, we need to congratulate uh, the people who worked on it because it's a, it's a difficult task. And I, I, I like guidelines. I think we must be in favor of guidelines for the non-experts. May I remind you that we started the, uh, so the um, sepsis guidelines in Brussels, nearby Brussels in Genval with the International Sepsis Forum. And then the American and the European societies came on board and it became the Surviving Sepsis Campaign. The problem is that the group expanded very much to 60 people now in a single room and they want to have guidelines that would be applicable as they are everywhere in the world, which in my mind is a mistake. You know, there is no point in saying that lactate levels cannot be obtained everywhere. No, use the guidelines to go to your authorities and say, look, we need to measure lactate. Instead of writing, ah, it may not be available, then the authorities will say, well, they are no legit. They know that there are some priorities in uh, our healthcare system. Okay, you will continue to do without lactate. Just to take one example. You know, monitoring systems is the same thing. There is almost nothing on monitoring systems. Oh, no, it's costly, difficult. Uh, well, say what's optimal. And then people will apply what they can apply and fight to get more to treat these patients. And the other thing that I don't like very much is that it's a one size fits all. You know, do this, do that, bam, bam. But, can't we be doctors wherever we are around the globe? They should be doctors to individualize therapies. Don't say, we don't need this, we don't need that. No, purification technician, no way, transfusions, no way, this, no way. No, please, can we think a little bit at the bedside? Can we look at cardiac output? Cardiac output is mentioned only once. Just to say that, you know, fluid administration can be um, helped with measurements of cardiac output. SVO2, well, it's hardly mentioned. We don't know how to use it when we read the, the guidelines. And that, that's a pity, you know? Uh, it's, uh, it, it's really, even though it's for the non-expert, we should not make it too simple. 65 millimeters of mercury arterial pressure in every single patient. It does not make sense. We need to individualize all this. The place of inotropic agents should be individualized. Where is it? It's not there. So <laughs> good exercise, but they could have done a better job. You, 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 almost, you almost gave all the responses uh, to the question I want to give you only once, which is already a good start, but let, let's discuss about a few points I think are interesting for our audience about the initial resuscitation. So there is still this 30 milliliters per kilograms initial bolus. Now it's within the first three hours. And they, they recommend that this dynamic measurement of fruit responsiveness, as you mentioned, and they said, basically, if you want to guide resuscitation, you don't need lactate, uh, CVO2, maybe you can use uh, CRT, capillary filling time. Is it a bit, as you said, a little bit um, too direct? And how do you interpret these uh, recommendations? Yes, indeed. Uh, there is too little about the initial resuscitation, which is fundamentally uh, important. Uh, they still come back with the, it, it's, it's just a suggestion of, given, uh, of giving uh, a, a given amount of fluid over three hours, three hours, that's so long. They should advise for half an hour. And then we should have at least an echo assessment or perhaps a cardiac output assessment to individualize the needs for fluids. Why giving amounts of fluids over three hours, you know? And also it's so, it's so individual. I mean, a patient with, Pneumonia may need much less fluid than a patient with generalized peritonitis. Where is it? Where does it appear? Nowhere. The admission to the ICU within six hours. Six hours? 
five minutes, 10 minutes, not more. If the patient is critically ill, if the patient is okay, maybe it's sepsis. Okay, you may have one hour, okay, but not more, unless there are ethical limitations, which is, uh, of course, uh, that should be mentioned as well. So, they, they, no, the initial resuscitation is, is, is not very well defined. The type of fluids either, you know, it, there is nothing wrong in giving saline solutions. Saline solutions cannot be harmful unless there is hyperchloremia. Hyperchloremia cannot be good. Where is it written in the guidelines? Nowhere. But that's the problem. I am here at a meeting on nephrology. We discuss the role of hyperchloremia on the kidneys. It does not appear in our guidelines as if we didn't know why we should be careful with saline administration, et cetera, you know? Um, well, uh, I have then a point that you touched a little bit, which is the, the blood pressure. No, we have this number 65. that is probably the association of a level of pressure to an increased risk of mortality in a large registry, which to me is nothing physiological because we don't have 65 minute pressure now. So my point to you, the guidelines underline the point that we have a study comparing, uh, let's say, 65 to higher levels with some effect on the renal replacement therapy. And then we have a second study in elderly patients where per permissive hypotension was, let's say, provided the same results in terms of outcome. Again, a little bit suggesting 65 should be kind of magic ballot uh, number to start with. And my question again is to you is how should we probably do it to the bedside. C65, a good starting point with just the, the minimum uh, threshold to obtain in these patients and then consider how to in, in individualize. Well, first of all, I think we should stop focusing only on mortality because all studies targeting mortality have been negative, except for harm maybe, but for benefit, nothing. Confusions, nothing. Hemodynamic measurements, nothing, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not surprising that for patient populations, you know, any study that will look at an optimal arterial pressure in populations must end up with negative results with no difference in outcome. But we know that people who are older with atherosclerosis, with a history of hypertension, will need a higher blood pressure than the others. We all know that some patients in the ICU will make urine when the blood pressure is a little higher than 65. Why don't you test the system? Why can't we be doctors at the bedside trying to increase arterial pressure to a somewhat higher level in an elderly patient in particular and see if the patient improves? You know, it's basic medicine, which is totally forgotten in large prospective randomized control trials showing no difference in mortality. We need to revisit all this and go for personalized medicine. Uh, another point that I think is interesting is about how to raise blood pressure when, of course, the patients remain hypotensive. There are some recommendations, for example, to add vasopressin first and then epinephrine to norepinephrine in case of persisting hypotension. And then this recommendation about steroids for ongoing vasopressor requirement, which is a bit vague. How do you see these two points? Well, um, I would like to speak about vasopressin for quite a long time because there is much to say. And as you know, we have worked on this. So there is some evidence that it could limit edema formation and it could protect the kidneys and increase urine output. Um, the celepressin study was totally negative. I didn't want to participate because there was no hemodynamic measurement. So the risk is that people focus only on blood pressure and forget about the rest, flow, oxygen delivery. And hopefully celepressin did not show harm, but we missed the opportunity to develop a new drug. With respect to corticosteroids, yeah, when you put together the Australian study with half of the patients who were not in shock and the Anand study where the patients were really in shock with a 40% mortality rate, that's septic shock. And you can realize that corticosteroids can be beneficial when there is real septic shock, but not in sepsis without shock. That's, uh, that's for sure. 
I maybe I'll ask the question for you because we would have many of those, of course, but you are limited in the concept of the e-chat. Are there are there any recommendation you find a little bit too rigid, or maybe something that you would like to have more discussion about into these guidelines? Well, first of all, I have always thought to have something on endotracheal intubation in uh, septic shock. It's totally missing. There is nothing there still now in the guidelines. Secondly. I want to emphasize that sedation may not be necessary. There is nothing about it in the guidelines. Actually, the guidelines speak about pulse pressure variation or stroke volume variation, which is applicable only in, 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 in deeply sedated patients. It's not even mentioned there, right? It's crazy. And, you know, some things are simplistic. Don't give vitamin C. Well, the recent meta-analysis are rather in favor of vitamin C, so let's explore it further. We should not discard it altogether. Likewise, you know, for nutrition, well, what is the message you got? That if possible, we can start nutritional support. That's too vague. If the patient is in severe shock on high dose of vasopressors, you should not start on nutrition. Start it when hopefully the gut uh, function will be at least possible when oxygen delivery will be improved. It could be dangerous to give uh, enteral nutrition to a patient with some ischemic uh, gut. I want to thank you for all the, this very thoughtful uh, um, um, information and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and opinions that you gave us. I think it's a uh, a nice uh, point for the audience to say that guidelines are guidelines. As you said, they can help non-experts in managing sepsis, but uh, behind this recommendation, we need a little bit of consensus. There are still open points which are not so clear and defined. And I think it is nice in our uh, discipline, we can still think at the bedside how to adjust these guidelines to our patients. And I hope maybe in the next uh, EasyCam, we'll have many pro and con debate discussing all the different points. So thanks again for all the for all this uh, this information you gave us and see you at the next teacher. Thanks Fabio. Bye. Ciao ciao. Bye bye. bye.